Welcome to Cyber Frontier, bringing you the latest news, trends, and hottest topics that focus on advances in cybersecurity and cyber industry economics. Our expert yet down-to-earth hosts make cybersecurity straightforward. They ask the tough questions and make this challenging topic something that everyone can understand. Our candid approach lets guests open up on topics we would all like to see addressed. You can find us on the web at newcyberfrontier.com. That's www.newcyberfrontier.com. Now join today's host as he introduces the topic for today's new Cyber Frontier. Welcome to today's episode of New Cyber Frontier. On today we have two of our host contributors. We're kind of giving a little interview here for Sean. We so often get behind the mic and are asking everybody else questions, finding out what everybody else is doing, but we don't get to uh, get our own things out. And Sean, we wanted to talk about all the wonderful things you have going on in the cybersecurity arena. Well, I don't think we have enough time for that. Uh, well, we can start. <laughs> um, but uh, welcome on today as a guest today instead of a host. Kind of crazy. Uh, yeah, it's it's great to actually be on the other side of the mic and uh, you know have that uh, collaborative discussion about uh, what's important to us as practitioners. Yeah. So what's the air like on the other side of the table there? It uh, it's actually uh, feels <laughs> a lot more spacious. Does yeah, I'm, I am kind of against the wall here, and you got the space over there in case we have multiple people. But uh, looks good in here, and you've been doing a great job. I th always want to thank you publicly for the the work you've done with New Cyber Frontier. Definitely helped to raise our audience and given a level of expertise that's just different than the rest of you know us hosts. So yeah, bring something. This is a great program, and I love contributing. Um, getting the word out for, you know, small cybersecurity businesses to those who are, you know, significant contributors out there globally. Um, just having, d continuing to have that discussion and, and get the word out. Yeah, so there's so many things that I know that you're involved with locally. And like you said, I can't even begin to mention them all. You basically are running the program with the EDC around here. With um, every month we do a get together with everybody in the local area, and hundreds of people go to that. Um, every event in town, I know you're helping plan things out of town. You're big in the in the Denver area as well, up and down the Front Range. But that's the local stuff. Recently, I know you're you're the chief operations officer for ISSA Global. Yeah, tell us so, about that. So you know. Um, ISSA International, if you don't know, uh, for those who are listening to the podcast, is the oldest and largest um, information cybersecurity nonprofit association in the world. So I, I say information cybersecurity because cybersecurity is nothing more than a rebranding of the old boring term of, you know, information security, right? So um, 1985, uh, ISSA was born. Uh, from a bunch of professionals who decided that, you know, like-minded people should collaborate and what better way to do that than with an association. Uh, fast forward um, many years later, uh, we've got a local gentleman in town. He was our chapter president for the Colorado Springs chapter of ISSA um, and uh, Mark Spencer. And he convinced me for professional development and collaboration, solve problems, you know, uh, come and, and join, uh, attend a couple of chapter meetings. And uh, if it's worth it, if you think to see the value, come and join. So that was back around 2007 time frame, mm -hmm. And uh, I loved it. I mean, a lot of people that I already knew uh, were attending chapter meetings. Um, I learned that uh, professional development, resume, um, they actually do classes for different types of information, cybersecurity certifications like uh, Security Plus. Uh, the local chapter here uh, has grown significantly. We uh, were at one point the second largest chapter in the world here in Colorado Springs. Denver's the largest. Uh, I think we're number three now down here in Colorado Springs, but we're still one of the largest chapters uh, in, in the world. And uh, the, the amount of collaboration, the events that we do, we have a spring conference, we have a fall conference, we do meetups on, on the weekends where, you know, somebody in, in a specific expertise in, say, maybe industrial control system, cybersecurity, they'll come and do a 90-minute presentation. If you're a member, you don't pay for any of that. 
Mm-hmm. So uh, that's what makes uh, ISSA, in my opinion, one of the best and, and strongest organizations out there. Um, after serving several years on the board, um, I wanted to contribute uh, at a higher level, so I ran for the International Board of Directors. Um, so in 2016, I was elected uh, as a director uh, to the International Board, and um, I found it very rewarding to be able to collaborate with others and, and help steer cyber at a, a global level. Mm-hmm. Um, traveling around, um, you know, going out and, for example, in 2017, I was invited out to The Hague to do a European CISO Summit and, and share, you know, what we're doing uh, at ISSA from the chapter level all the way up to the global level. Okay, well, let's take a break here, hear from our sponsors. We'll be right back in a minute. Cyber Resilience Institute helps build strong cyber communities designed to prevent members from attack. Like building a neighborhood watch, it takes coordination and a sharing community to protect our identities and valuables in the virtual world. Typically, we hear that organizations know they need to do something to protect their cyber assets, but don't know where to begin. Let Cyber Resilience Institute help your community create an action plan. Cyber Resilience Institute will build your community or business marketplace so that it is designed to support a collective cyber defense. Contact them for more information at cyberresilienceinstitute.org. Welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. On today, we have the host roundtable, right? We have Dr. Sean Murray on the other side of the the mic, so to say, or the table, so to say. Uh, And you were talking about your background and recently uh, board of directors for ISSA. And I know just this last year, you ran then for chief operations officer. Yeah, we actually uh, we had a lot of a uh, lot of growth and 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 got through a lot of uh, significant challenges at the international level with restructuring and the growth and 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 having to uh, compete with other you know organizations that are out there and try to come back to our grassroots. Um, and our, our chief operations officer was uh, re- was retiring from the board, and uh, you know it's a volunteer position; it's not paid. And so um, I decided to run for the board at the chief operations officer level. Uh, I have a, a significant background in operations, not just the cyber piece. So my contributions now are more along the lines of you know, the health and status of the association on the executive board uh, with the president, vice president, myself, and the treasurer. Um, you know, and then helping bring that strategy back to the board of directors as a whole so that uh, we can continue to grow and, and provide more value to our members and uh, more capabilities to our chapters. Yeah, I know uh, it was just since you started as a host here that you ran for that, passed around the election. I know I voted for you. So Well, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Always, definitely. Uh, something I know I don't have time for in my life right now is a run for another board or position. Right. I barely, uh, I it's try to get so much s- bandwidth in our lives too. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Maybe when I'm finished with my PhD, we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, but what was it, what was it like running? Did you get, tell us about the experience and, and what, how you, you know, and, so, and, and you're going through this as well. You're, you're completing your PhD. Uh, I completed mine in 2011 and, you know, we grow our own careers And then we get to a point where it's time to turn it around. And that is supporting your community, supporting um, things like the Better Business Bureau, supporting things like the Small Business Development Center, um, going out and doing conferences and talking to small business, and then mentoring those people who are are coming up behind you that you're expecting to replace you someday. I don't, I'm not growing my career anymore. Um, I think I've hit... Um, uh, uh, you know, at that point where I'm comfortable being. So it's not about self-promotion. It's really about promoting those others that are out there. And so um, where I feel a lot of reward these days is, is help building up um, the next cybersecurity leaders. Um, what can we do to contribute to their education, to their workforce development, and get them in a, in a role? In, in my position with uh, ISSA uh, helps us do that, recognize where uh, we've come from. So for me, I'm not looking for rewards, but when I'm recognized by my own peers in in an association like ISSA, I find that very, very rewarding. In the last year, 
Um, in the last two years, um, I was nominated for and, and received ISSA fellow, um, mm -hmm. which was very rewarding to stand in front of my peers on a stage with the president and of our association and, and, and be recognized for those contributions. You know, I don't need to be recognized by everyone else, but when you're recognized by your peers, I find that really rewarding. Um, this past year, um, I received the, uh, the, um, uh, the Hall of Fame Award, um, where, you know, again, recognized at a higher level for my contributions. And, you know, I, I say my contributions, it is working with other people and, and helping to solve complex problems or easy problems. And so that's where I find it a, a lot more rewarding um, in, in that role as COO and as, as someone who gets to work with others in, in our association. Yeah. So now you had kind of an announcement you wanted to put out that you'll be looking at running for another level. Let's talk about where you're going with this. Well, so, you know, um, we have been progressively over the last few years um, um, improving a lot of areas within the, uh, the association at the international level. And I think we're at a point now where... Um, that I think I can contribute at, uh, at a, the highest leadership level. And um, I'm announcing my candidacy. I'm going to be running for president this year. Um, I have a lot of support. I've had a lot of people, uh, distinguished fellows, fellows, Hall of Famers, um, uh, asking me, you know, hey, you've got a lot of great ideas. Uh, you're collaborative. Um, you're out in the community. You actually uh, come and talk to people. And we value that uh, opinion. And so we'd love to see you run at the international level. And professionally, I think that would be the epitome of, of, of the ultimate contribution. Ultimate contribution, okay. So tell us, as you look at this role, is there key platforms, things that you run on, that you say, this is what I want to do with this organization? Well, absolutely. Yeah. Give I mean, us some of those. E even though it's a volunteer position, um, you, you have to have a strategy. Uh, you, it's not just a position of... Uh, of stature. Um, the role of the president, in my opinion, should be leading the association and our industry everywhere. Uh, last year, um, you know, you and I both uh, uh, partnered with our, our county government, our state government, and we, you know, went with the chamber, and we're on Capitol Hill. We're talking about cybersecurity with the Department of Energy. We're on Capitol Hill talking to our legislators, our congressmen, our senators. This is what the face of the president should be doing. It should be outward facing. Our membership should see that. Um, advocating for cybersecurity, for our association, for our members, and for small business and for large business. Getting the word out. Having some type of influence on the legislation that's mm -hmm. being passed. Right now, we do not have a, a national privacy law. Um, you know, we were collaborating last year with Margie Graves, the deputy CIO for uh, the U.S. government. That's what the president should be doing is having those complex conversations, working with other members, distinguished members of our association in specific areas like industrial control systems. I'm not an expert in those areas, but I know we've got members that are that have been doing that for years. Reach in, pull out that expertise. And, and, and help funnel that to try and change the demographics of how we uh, perceive information in cybersecurity and how we help our legislators, our leaders, solve those problems. Okay, so I, I heard uh, three separate things there. One, a outreach, engaging leaders, um, to a critical infrastructure or a... That's just one, yeah, one industry, right? Yeah, and then three, a training aspect and, and training the next generation. Do you have benchmarks or things, hey, what is success if my, in my right. presidency if I achieve these things? And let's do one now and then take a break, and we'll come back after the break. All right, so it, it's a good point. You know, you have large aspirations, and um, you've got to turn those into strategy. Once we write them all down, uh, you got to talk to other people because, you know, you may have great ideas, um, but you need to talk to others to see what's reasonable. And, you know, there's only one way to eat an elephant, one bite at a time, and I may not get through the entire elephant during my term as, as a president. 
but you want to be able to set a catalyst for success moving forward that gets some momentum that's recognized by leaders in our in our government by our own peers that allows us to get additional resources get additional awareness and help the association the industry succeed okay well let's take a break we're going to hear from our sponsors and we come back and we'll say here's your platform we talked about three areas we can identify some more and what is success what do we look to achieve in each of those areas sure we'll be right back after we hear from our sponsors Security Services are your cybersecurity experts with decades of experience providing professional training services for our clients in various industries. We offer professional training and certification in areas of cybersecurity, safety, health, and environmental services at our academy. Our in person and online training provides a collaborative environment where students can interact directly with instructors through live chats or in private classrooms. Visit murraysecurityservices.com for more information. Welcome back to New Cyber Frontier. On today, we have our host as a guest, Dr. Sean Murray, who just announced his candidacy for president for ISSA next year, seeking seeking the, the position. Um, and we were talking before the break about some areas that he looks at as this is what ISSA should be doing. And we thought we'd go a little deeper and say, okay, in education, in that bringing the next generation up, what does success look like what would you say we hit these goal these goals these objectives and that's successful for my presidency well so the first piece of it is collaborating with um, our members our members should be number one ahead of everything else and so going back to that level of expertise that various members have right tap into uh, that level of expertise um, some of the things that I'm looking at are collaboration platforms within the ISSA International uh, social media site, which is very, it's closed. Um, mm -hmm. It's a closed uh, platform where we can establish um, groups, uh, you know, like special interest groups that we used to have. Uh, we've brought one back and, and allow people to collaborate in those areas and then pull that expertise out and the president should be should not be trying to solve all the problems themselves. That's what the board is for. But executing that strategy is going to take a collaborative approach by looking at your membership. All right. And, and then look, what are the available resources to be able to, uh, to have this happen? Well, um, again, the public facing uh, the president should be you know, working with the executive director of the, the association to um, help identify and solidify memorandums of agreement with strategic partners like EC Council, like CompTIA, like ISC Square, where a member benefit could be a significant discount on training. Those are the certification bodies. What about other companies? Uh, I'm not going to pick any any you know big ones out because those are just certification bodies. But the primary training providers across the globe. What kind of a discount can you get from them? Pass that on as value to the membership. Yeah, so as far as that supporting members, I would, I would a, a lot of, like if you hold multiple credentials, you're going through continued education. Sure. For all of them individually. You have to register them all. Do It seems like some kind of an agreement to make that more streamlined, since now everybody holds 10 credentials after their name might be a benefit that, that you could push through. What do you think about something like that? Yeah, that's a great idea. You know, I don't know that I've heard anybody ever um, talk about that single point, but man, what a great idea. See, that's a contribution. This is what I'm talking about. Here you've got somebody who wants to run for president listening to a member who or help both happen to be hosts for the show. That's a great idea. Why wouldn't we approach the large... Uh, uh, the large organizations and streamline how we populate our CPEs. I know I hate it at the end of the year. I record everything in my ISU Square account, and then at the end of the year, I go back and I populate all the other ones. 
But see, this is an example of listening to your membership when they've got a great idea, seeing what you can do. The face of the, the president should be able to reach out to the president of ISC Square, Jay Bravasi, or ISC Square to their board, or whatever these other ones are, to establish whatever that. Yes, they're competitors, but at the same time, that is an approach that could get additional capabilities um, as provided as value for our members. Yeah, I definitely know the more credentials people have, you hear this all the time. It's Absolutely. Like, how do Why I do, keep track of it? How do we make it easier? And we'll, we'll help you out that, with that with some, some blockchain things that, that we have going on. Um, now, the second thing you talked about was a key area, and I'll leave the, the uh, policy one for last. But the second one was critical infrastructure. And that resonates with me because I've been in that industry for a while. And cybersecurity is almost entirely different for critical infrastructure. Um, the example I always give is, for years I helped design SCADA networks and control systems. And then I went to, to work with NIST and a working group, and they were all talking about data. And my whole project for five or six years didn't care about data. And you know why? Because the data was, I'm off, I'm on, I'm off, I'm on, right. I'm off, I'm on, a million times for 10 years. That data had no value. So now everything was about information security in the NIST working group. And I'm like, this isn't even relevant to my whole industry. Sure. Um, but there's that divide where then what was important there was trust. I need to trust every piece of the network. Right. On the information security, they packaged it up put privacy on it, shipped it out, and didn't even know how many computers it went across. So that that kind of... And it probably divide, wasn't encrypted either. And it, yeah, <laughs> they, they didn't even know that they, whether they trusted those computers or not because they didn't know how many it went across. It's just the Internet. Right. So that, that divide, it resonates a little deeper than that, but that's the first part of it. How do we now span and make a focus of critical infrastructure from an information infosec kind of look to say, well, wait a minute, a little different animal. How do we join the two? Yeah, so this, again, goes back to the face of the president should be with other significant contributors in the association, our fellows, our distinguished fellows, our Hall of Famers, um, uh, you know, working within our own government. Start at the local level. What are you doing at the local level? What challenges do you have? This is where a great partnership with your chambers. Um, you know, our ISSA chapter became a member of the chamber a couple of years ago. You know why? Because we can contribute to the chamber, which also has the, the ear of leadership within our local state government who's representing us at the national level. Why wouldn't you have that collaboration uh, specifically on manufacturing topics? Industrial control systems and manufacturing is, you know, is a similar topic, but it's still industrial control systems. National critical infrastructure, under the Obama administration, they came out and said, you know, we need to categorize 16 areas of national cyber or critical infrastructure, which uh, requires the protection. And so defense industrial base, the, our bridges, our dams are, uh, are all part of the national critical infrastructure. You, you pull from the expertise and you allow your influence to partner with other associations like the chamber, uh, like the small business development centers and the, the small business administration. And as a unified, larger representation, you go to your legislators and, and you have those discussions that need to be made. And you know what? I have the expertise with me from our own association in those industries. I'm not doing it myself. Uh, it'd be unreasonable for any president not to utilize the expertise and the resources of its members and its chapters to be able to move forward and provide, number one, value to your members, show them that we are a moving force and in, in that we value what their contributions are as well. Yeah. Okay, so we, we kind of moved to now the policy, right? And we talked, you know, in both of these areas about everything kind of leads to we have to and in my opinion, we have to find money for it. Right. Because, especially with critical infrastructure, I've heard the, for years, we have to do something. We have to identify, we have to categorize, we have to make a framework, we have to classify. But now we have to do something. How do we influence our policymakers to do something, which basically means spending some money? What is success in that area, as your presidency would, would deem? So I'll tell you, I've learned a lot over the last uh, few years working with 
um, Colorado legislators, our, our, our state and federal congressional leaders, um, uh, Congressman um, uh, Nagu, okay. Nagu up in uh, the northern part, uh, just above Denver, uh, I went up to a Colorado chamber, and we had this discussion. And so uh, I learned about some of the challenges as a junior congressional leader. Um, you know, at any one point, there's three to 600 bills um, on the House floor, and, and the Speaker gets to decide what goes up to, to be voted on. And so it's the squeaky wheel, I think, mm -hmm. that, that through our legislators, I'll go to testify on Capitol Hill. We've had some of our members do that. Um, and, and I think it's that level of visibility to, that lets our, our leaders know that these are, these are the, the regulatory um, things that you know, need to, to happen. We're working through our chambers right now. I'm on the board working through the Colorado Attorney General's office. You know, stop passing cybersecurity laws and bills and privacy laws that don't have a compliance component to it. You, you scare everybody, tell them they have to comply, but how do we comply? Build that stuff in that tells a small business or a regular business, what do I need to do? What's the checklist? And then how do I comply and how are you gonna assess me? What is reasonable to spend? Because I'll tell you the feedback I get from small businesses, we don't understand it. Therefore, we're, you know, we got a password on our computer and that's all we're doing. Yeah. So that's you, where we can influence change. Back so at the policy level. When you say compliance, now this year alone, I've seen several entirely new compliance structures come out. The the C2M2, the um the CISA, we just had people on talking about it at the beginning of this year, how yeah. we have a new framework. I remember last year we had you know, risk management framework. We had the NIST 171. It seems like every we year have the CMMC. <laughs> every year we we have a whole new framework before we even get used to the last one, before we ever implement it. It almost seems to add to the confusion. How can we streamline and not say Let's reinvent the wheel every year because some new organization got on, on board and has taken over. And I'm in framework hell, basically. Which right. one do you look at? What's going to be here next year? If we hold our breath, is this one gone and replaced next year? Well, what if you're in an industry? Um, uh, I'll give you an example. We have a client that's uh, in manufacturing. He has clients that are in various federal agencies, including the DOD. Everybody's got their own standard. So this poor guy has got a bookcase full of different approaches, different frameworks he has to comply with. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that's, that, to your point, this is where we come back. Uh, we take a look at what's going on with the cybersecurity maturity model right now. Um, they're taking uh, pieces of the ISO 27001 framework. They're taking pieces of the NIST 171 framework. They're taking pieces of the CIS controls framework. But to your point is, how much is enough? And so how do I comply with multiple frameworks without mm -hmm. expending too many resources? Um, one of them is to have a, 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 a consulting agreement with a firm that understands that compliance. And that's what we see a lot of our organizations doing. But bring it back to the basic level. What is a, what is a standard maturity level look like? Because one framework focuses on policies and personnel and compliance. The other focuses on uh, configuration and controls and risk management. And so depending on your industry, it's all risk, right? At the end of the day, uh, what is it that you need to comply with based on your industry? If I'm healthcare, it's HIPAA. And if I'm publicly traded, better add Sarbanes-Oxley in there. Oh, and I have an academic component because I have um, st medical students. Now I'm talking about FERPA. Oh, I collect credit cards too, PCI DSS. They all have their own frameworks. So as president, how do you suggest helping minimize this confusion? So I can tell you our current president, uh, Candy Alexander, um, she was on uh, uh, a, what we call, uh, it's a different board where she was trying to help solve that problem with, uh, by collaborating with NIST on the NICE framework and a couple other initiatives. And I think that um, we should refresh that discussion, not just with NIST, um, but again, going back to the legislators, look, we don't need a thousand frameworks to comply with. Um, 
we, what we need to do as an association is, again, pull those SMEs from those various areas. I mean, it's, you may be cyber in healthcare, cyber in, in finance, cyber in um, national. I mean, we've got one of, our, one of our CISO executive members is, he just left Amtrak, but he's a CISO for Amtrak. Talk about industrial control systems. You know, you're talking about our rail systems, our national rail systems. There's a guy with a lot of years of experience that you don't solve these problems yourself. You bring them up. What is the commonalities? What are the common controls? Let's have a common control framework that you can map easily across the board. I think that's something that over a period of maybe three to five years, maybe ISSA can lead the charge on that. All right. So you hear it, heard it here first. Uh, Dr. Murray for President ISSA. We hope that that's successful and we'll do everything here we can. Um, and thanks for giving us your views today and hope we can make this a reality. Well, thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Definitely. Chris. All right, and thanks for your contribution here all the way around. Have a good day. All right, thanks. Thank you for listening to New Cyber Frontier. Remember to follow or like our post and circulate each new show to your networks. We keep you informed, bring you the latest news, explore new trends, and find the hottest topics. With New Cyber Frontier, you don't have to be a computer or cybersecurity expert. Just get plugged in. We encourage you to get involved. Tell us what topics interest you and join our mailing lists. You can find us on the web at www dot newcyberfrontier.com that's newcyberfrontier.com check out our previous interviews and please let us know if there are any topics that you would like to hear discussed see you next time on new cyber frontier